Hi, so I'm Barn Williams and we're back on the small print. And tonight I've got with me Alex Gladstein, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Human Rights Foundation. To start off with, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself so that you don't have to do the, the awkward reading a bio thing? Sure. As you said, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation. Thanks for having me on. I've been working with HRF, as we call it, since 2007. Our mission is to help promote individual rights and civil liberties in closed societies around the world. We support democracy movements, journalists, uh, and human rights activists, and we oppose authoritarianism, tyranny, corruption, and human rights violations. And in my career, I've spent a lot of time looking at the intersection of technology and human rights and the tools that individuals are using to defend themselves and the tools that governments are using to create larger systems of surveillance and control. Great. So the purpose of this show that we're putting together is really for people, that it's consumers and citizens. So that is both those sort of people that are acting in the economic side of the market and the political side of the market to get them to understand what's going on in the policy frontier in terms of what policies are in place already that are impacting on their lives. And then also what are the sort of policies that are going to be impacting on people's lives further on? Because the big challenge that we've seen is that democracy is democracy by name and not really by nature in a lot of countries. And many people don't actually understand how the rules that they're operating under in their societies actually impact on them. And the reason I wanted to speak to you is that, of course, you are quite close to the human rights connection with the whole crypto economy and what's going on there. And from a South African perspective, crypto is quite a, I suppose, quite a synonymous name with capitalism per se. I'm not sure if you're very familiar with the BTC global scam, which costs like billions of rands worth of money that evaporates sort of people that essentially invested in crypto permit schemes a couple of years back. That was in 2018. So a lot of people got burned at that whole sort of bull market run that happened there and the subsequent sort of bubble that happened thereafter, mainly because of bad actors in the space. But at the same time, that means that people are sort of seeing the crypto space as being synonymous with capitalism and with perhaps bad actors that might be looking to exploit people. But that's not exactly the whole story when it comes to crypto, because crypto is different things to different people. It can be the rich man's tax haven, but it can also be the poor guy's lifeline, depending on what sort of nation state that you are living in and what sort of rule system that you're trying to navigate as a citizen. I'll just to give you a bit of background, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the South African setup and the fact that we have probably a, a not a particularly strong state, but not a failed state by any means, but we are in a particularly precarious environment, economically speaking. Our currency is highly dependent on imports, exports, and it's, a, it's quite a weak currency in relation to everything else that's going on in the world. At the same time, our political situation is a bit tenuous. We've had massive corruption scandals that have gone on. And the future of both the RAND and the political side of the South African market is, is getting people to be a bit concerned about their future going forward. So to start off with, what I really wanted to ask you is what can crypto do for someone in a country like South Africa? It's not exactly in a Lebanon or an Argentina or like a Greece state at the moment, but it is a direction that we could be heading in. How can crypto help people that are not in the top echelons of society, not the people that are currently using this and dominating sort of Twitter and the media sphere as sort of capitalizing on this as a, as a way to get rich mm -hmm. quick? How can it help the other side of the market? Yeah. So I think some semantics are important to lay out here. Uh, crypto, I don't think in general can help there. Uh, what I think you mean by crypto is cryptocurrency. There yeah. are 4,000 cryptocurrencies listed on websites like CoinMarketCap. 99.9% .9 of them are outright pyramid schemes uh, or Ponzi schemes or rug pulls. Um, and they, in fact, will not help the average person get an edge on anyone else. Uh, they, at best, uh, can be exploited if you're an insider uh, and you helped create one of these things uh, and you got in early and you, able, you were able to exchange Bitcoin, for example, uh, for a bunch of these IOUs and then, and then you know, help drive the price up in this artificial marketplace and then, and then dump it on other retail uh, investors. This is like essentially the life cycle of thousands of different cryptocurrencies. 
So that's why crypto. I would that's why I would say in general, crypto is not going to help anyone uh, in that area. Um, but if we kind of work on the semantics here, um, there is another technology that that will, and that's Bitcoin. So so Bitcoin is very important because it, it isn't owned by anybody, unlike all the other cryptocurrencies. It wasn't created by a foundation. Uh, or a, a company. It's not backed by VCs. It has no board. Uh, again, it has no foundation. Uh, there is no small group of people who control it. So it is extremely different from like all these other uh, assets that people refer to as cryptocurrencies. And because of that, it actually is a way for the average person to get an edge on everyone else. Uh, in as much as, regardless of your nationality, you speak about South Africa, but I mean, it, it, it's just as powerful for Zimbabweans or Zambians or Mos you know, folks from Mozambique or Madagascar or wherever. Uh, it, it is uh, completely unperturbed with your religion, your opinions, your gender, your uh, ethnicity, uh, your nationality, et cetera. It's a neutral open source network and nobody can print more or change the issuance schedule. Uh, there was no pre-mine, you know, there was no sit part, chunk of Bitcoin allocated at the creation to give to insiders. Um, it was a fair launch, meaning like Satoshi uh, warned the world about Bitcoin in October 2008, didn't even start the network until several months later. So like put it out there, said, hey, I'm going to do this. Then they started doing it in January 2009. It took more than a year for any Bitcoin to accrue any sort of monetary value at all. So it was like a big open scientific radical experiment for more than a full year before it actually was worth anything. So it was a very fair launch. Anyone could have joined and participated. And at the time, you didn't need specialized equipment. All you needed was essentially a computer um, to mine 50 Bitcoin. <laughs> Every 10 minutes, 50 Bitcoin were distributed for those first four years. And anyone could have gotten involved. So for all these reasons, Bitcoin is very different from crypto. I would say almost that Bitcoin is the antithesis of crypto. But when people say crypto, what they're usually referring to are these uh, corporate monies created by small groups of people or cartels, uh, again, th that, that are you know, minted with the click of a button with no effort or expenditure, uh, and then like hyped up into like uh, this like feverish cycle, uh, sold at the top, um, so that the insiders and their friends can pocket the gains and then dumped on retail customers. So that's crypto. And I would say crypto, I, you know, is the sort of, uh, you know, like hypothesis of like, or, or it's like the, it's like the kind of like the, the worst aspects of cap, the capitalist system. Bitcoin, again, very, very different here. Like, no owner of Bitcoin or user of Bitcoin is special in the eyes of the law, no matter how much you own. You might own 0.01 BTC. You might own 100 BTC. Uh, the rules are the same for both of you. Neither of you get like a special, uh, you can't access the system faster. There's no way that you can like decide that your transaction is going to go through first based on your stature. Everybody gets a quality of opportunity here. Um, no one can be rejected from the network based on their identity, et cetera. So Bitcoin is this really interesting political phenomenon that's, that's, it's capitalist, yes, but it's also like, I don't know, it has some elements of communitarian philosophy behind it in terms of like, like that, that no corporate or governmental actor can, can like violate the, the foundational principles behind it. So it, it borrows a little bit of thinking from the sort of far left critics of the dollar standard and of the sort of colonial world. It's, I'd say Bitcoin's very anti-colonial, okay, in that way, because um, using that work does not accrue power to some government or, or colonial entity, okay? It's actually a way, almost in that Marxist sense of like workers owning their, being able to control their time and energy. But at the same time, it's like very capitalistic because it's extremely, uh, extremely free market. Like there, there's no, you know, Bitcoin trades all the time. Anyone can enter and exit. It's entirely voluntary and peaceful. No one's forcing you to use it. Okay. So it's this really interesting political phenomenon taking the world by storm today, which is not, it's the opposite of crypto, but it's, it's got some really interesting capitalistic elements to it. It also has some really interesting sort of anti-colonial kind of almost like 
uh, yeah, um, borderline socialist kind of ideals that, that, that are kind of in it. It's a very weird animal that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I'm so glad you picked that up and spoke about the difference between what Bitcoin is and what crypto is, because that is something that I've definitely noticed from where we stay based on just the conversations people have. The ideas have been conflated based on the history and based on the sort of people that have been burned in various, as you mentioned, sort of pyramid schemes. And of course, the sort of pump and dumps and sort in terms of the of the other sorts of coins are, as you said, the worst parts of basically like your penny stock pump and dump schemes that people can get into on the stock market, but just not regulated at all either. And because this show really does try to unpack the more sort of the legal ease side of these various different systems and what's going on there, you mentioned quite briefly that this can't really be controlled by authoritarians, can't really be controlled by private interests. Or, or by Democrats. Really, or, yeah, or by, or, by corp, or by public sector interests. And mm-hmm. maybe you can unpack that a little. Why is it impossible or at least very, very hard for nation states or for governments or for antagonistic capital interests Mm -hmm. to regulate the Bitcoin system. So let's talk about Bitcoin now rather than crypto now that you've made that distinction because I didn't want to get into that. Yeah, it's just as an interesting side effect. I was in some conversations with someone earlier today and they're they're talking about, um, you know, it's interesting. They they define socialism as an economy where workers own their own production. And (laughs) it's funny to me because that's kind of what I'm talking about with Bitcoin, you can actually own your time and effort. Literally. You can own that. <laughs> Literally, you can control the private key. No one else can. It's not owned by some corporation or slave master. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting how it borrows kind of, it doesn't borrow anything. It just merely is. It's an open source software project, but it, it's, it, it, it can be seen through different lenses. And, and certainly like people who've been behind the struggle for workers or for the struggle against corruption, you know, can both kind of see interesting things in Bitcoin. Now, as far as like, why is it resilient to mm. capture uh, or... That's uh, a great word. We know all about capture here in South Yeah, Africa. I mean, exactly. <laughs> why is it resilient to state capture or ban uh, or mm. corporate manipulation? Um, there's, there's theoretical reasons and there's also practical reasons. The practical reasons are more important. Um, yeah. We like to say in Bitcoin that Bitcoin works in practice, but not in theory. Uh, and this is frustrates a lot of theorists. So people who are economic or monetary theorists don't like Bitcoin generally because uh, it doesn't fit their theories, but it works in practice. So like the people using Bitcoin in Joburg or Lagos or Buenos Aires, like they don't care about the theories of some dude in England. They really could give a shit. It's just not interesting to them. The thing works, okay? So it does not comply with monetary theory. Like like it does not make any sense. It doesn't fit into the buckets that uh, people in white towers have created, okay? In ivory towers, Um, but it works on the streets. Like it works. It works really freaking well, right? It, it, It works. So, you know, I think that's important to also underline that like, one of the reasons why people have been so frustrated with Bitcoin is that it, it doesn't work super well in theory. Like it doesn't comply with today's theories. Um, but in general, why is it resilient? Uh, we are drawing on history. I, I'm going to be explaining why it's resilient because of historical events, not not theoretically. So in 2017, a, a conflict came to a head in the Bitcoin community. Uh, and it's essentially called the the block size war or the scaling war. And ever since Satoshi posted the Bitcoin white paper to the cypherpunks mailing list in October, 2008, the question has been, how does this thing scale? Like, how does it scale to a billion users? Um, It seems almost primitive in the way that it focuses on security and caution over speed and uh, convenience and onboarding lots of users, right? Um, it has been prohibitive in that sense, meaning it's taken a decade to get where it is because it wasn't designed necessarily for uh, to move fa- to move fast and break things and onboard a billion people. That's not the way it was designed. And ever since that first post, actually, the the first person who reacted to Satoshi's post, original post, was someone who basically said, "This is a cool idea, but it's not going to scale." And ever since then. Uh, through 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, people were arguing about how it would scale. How was it going to go from this thing that only does about seven transactions per second to, you know, feeding the whole world? Like, how, how's that going to work? So there were like basically two camps in the block size war or the scaling war. Um, this really came to 
the four in 2015 and then 2015, 16, 17, that the war kind of raged and then it ended at the end of 2017. But basically without going into too much technicality, um, one camp said, uh, and this is the camp I would be in, but like essentially that we should not sacrifice decentralization for speed. Okay. We, and, and we should preserve the rights of the Bitcoin users to use cheap equipment to be able to verify the whole monetary supply. The, the, the thing that makes Bitcoin actually valuable is the fact that no government can decide to issue more Bitcoin whenever it wants. That's actually the difference between Bitcoin and every other crypto and every other fiat system. It makes it more similar to gold in that way. Um, mm. And that's called 21 million. When we say 21 million in Bitcoin, we're referring to the limit of the ultimate amount of Bitcoin that will ever be created. But we're also kind of creating a little mantra that, that describes the idea that, that no politician or corporation or group of interests can change the monetary policy of Bitcoin. That's what we say when we mean 21 million. Yeah. Okay, 21 million. So we wanted to preserve 21 million, those of us who wanted to protect decentralization, because it, it, basically if you keep Bitcoin where it is doing a handful of transactions per second, uh, each block, meaning each group of transactions, uh, is relatively small. And, and the blockchain itself, the ledger of all the historical Bitcoin transactions stays pretty small over time. And it gets more efficient, but essentially, you know, today it's quite easy to run. It's about 300 gigabytes, okay, to have all the transactions in the Bitcoin network yeah. from June, January to 2009 to today. You can fit it on a cheap device that you can plug into your computer. So it can okay? still be decentralized for people that are cashing Meaning, out. no, it, 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 <laughs> it's not, it, it is, it's not a verb, it's a noun. Like Bitcoin is decentralized, meaning it lives on all these personal servers run by individuals around the world, tens of thousands of them. There is no single point of yeah. failure. And that's the way you that keep like, that. yeah. And these people are called small blockers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they, and, and I, we believe that, that we, Bitcoin needs to be kept uh, on the base layer, uh, uh, very efficient and small um, so that we can audit the monetary supply ourselves. That's like the huge deal here is that any user of Bitcoin can make sure there's no funny business happening. We can verify all the incoming new blocks. We can make sure that there's never more than 21 million. We are the guardians. There's tens of thousands of us. Okay. Um, the other side of the camp were like people that were eager to get more and more people into Bitcoin as a payment system. So they wanted the blocks to be really big so that we could mm -hmm. accommodate a lot more people. More so what ends up, yeah, well, what, what ends up happening when you have giant blocks is that no longer can you or I run the Bitcoin software at home on a personal server. It's too big. It's not 300 gigabytes. It's going to be many, many terabytes. And not only do you have size, but you also have latency issues, like sending this, like from like trying to sync it is very difficult, right? So this is what Ethereum has run into as another kind of competing blockchain yeah. project. It's extremely difficult to sync the, the whole Ethereum history. It's almost impossible. Only a handful of people in the world can do it. So the fear um, that small blockers had with the plans of the big blockers was that if they ended up making the block size really big, that no user at home could run the whole history, okay? And this would result in what's called data center Bitcoin, meaning like only a handful of entities would control the Bitcoin ledger. This would open the door for collusion, cartels, and the entire fiat system just to repeat itself. So yeah. there was this big fight between users who focused on freedom and decentralization and corporations that wanted to change Bitcoin to make more money, like in the short term. This came to the head in uh, came to a head in uh, spring of 2017 at something called uh, basically the consensus. It was a conference in New York City in the spring of uh, May 2017, and there was an agreement that was signed called the New York Agreement. Okay, the New York Agreement was like uh, an attempt at capturing Bitcoin, and it was done with the signatures of miners. Wall Street people, Silicon Valley people, very powerful billionaires, et cetera. And they like boasted 83% of all the Bitcoin hash rate, meaning all the mining power in the world. So 83 yeah. plus percent of it. They claimed tens of millions of wallets, dozens of companies. They basically had the majority of like power in the network and all of the and like uh, infrastructure and a lot of the money. Um, they failed. So, so this was sort of a David and Goliath thing. Like they were the Goliath. They came in and said, we're going to change Bitcoin. We're going to make it data center Bitcoin. We're going to onload more people. The users were like, no, nah, I don't think so. So the users mounted a, like a counter campaign, grassroots counter campaign that summer called UASF, which stands for user activated soft fork. And they basically, um, they fought this corporate alliance and they won. And the corporate alliance fell apart 
and it ended up being uh, split off. Some of the people who promoted this like idea, which was called SegWit 2X, was this uh, the corporate alliance's plan for Bitcoin was they wanted to like 2X the block box size through a hard fork didn't work they ended up creating their own version of bitcoin they forked off into bitcoin cash which then later became yeah. bitcoin sv and bitcoin abc and all these other things all that stuff's like worth nothing compared to bitcoin today so they they wasted billions of dollars in doing and trying to attack bitcoin in this way so when we say bitcoin is resilient to capture we're not talking theory here we're like describing something we've learned through experience like the Bitcoin network, because it's powered by thousands of individuals around the world who are unbeknownst to each other, like I don't know who's running the nodes, we have no idea. Um, no entity can come in and like force a change. Each node makes its own decisions. So I control my node. I get to decide what software I want to run. So if some big corporation comes in and says, we're going to make a better Bitcoin, good luck. They can do that. I'm not going to install it on my own node. Okay. So the users control Bitcoin is the lesson of this whole thing. And that makes it really, really different from the fiat system or from other cryptos where someone else controls the system. And that's like the most important lesson to bring away from this and why I believe it's such a powerful tool for human rights and liberation. Yeah, that's a great point to pick up on. So why is Bitcoin important for human rights, for freedom and for liberty in general? How can this essential cryptocurrency, this piece of code, this network that you've described, how can it help individual citizens, particularly citizens in third world or in developing nations with weak and perhaps corrupt states? How does it help the little guy? Yeah, well, look, it helps everybody. So, um, yeah. it, it, which is why it ends up helping people in emerging markets. Um, but essentially, the reason why like more and more people in emerging markets are turning to Bitcoin is because their currencies are really bad. Okay, so just some data here. Uh, 1.2 billion people live under double or triple digit inflation today. So it's not just like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. You know, a lot of like oh, economists, they like to say, oh, it's a rare thing. Okay, no, it's not. So actually like huge countries with 100, 200 million people live under double or triple digit inflation. We're talking massive countries like Pakistan, Nigeria, Argentina, Turkey. Um, so these countries have 200 million, 200 million, 50 million, a hundred million people. And, you know, people are losing uh, a lot of their time and energy through, through high inflation here. And, you know, in West, in, in the U S in the EU in Japan or whatever, uh, generally speaking over the last few decades, you know, we've been trained to believe that like a small amount of inflation is good. Okay. And, and it doesn't really hurt us that badly. Right. And, and it, it allows for central banks to do all kinds of interesting monetary policy. Fine. Um, that's okay, a very small percentage of the world. <laughs> like most yeah. people don't have access to the Euro or the dollar that they they're on some other currency, which is like way worse and it gets debased. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> we, we are aware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't know what, what, what is the rand done against the dollar over the last 30 years we, or against gold. We don't like to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Which sucks. I mean, that's like, if you're a pub, like there's a large public sector in your country mm. and those, those are, those earners are those wage earners are earning wages, which are denominated and, and distributed in rand, and that rand is not a good store of value, unfortunately, no. uh, for them. So they go, so they just like Zimbabweans, ironically, you know, it's all just like a, it's like a ladder of evil. But yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. The Zimbabweans <laughs> want rand. No, they'd rather have dollars, but they'll take rand because it's way better than their currency. Now, you, still you all, a, we've got a pretty decent central bank as far as these central banks compared, go. compared to Zimbabwe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. that your neighbors just to the north of you would be delighted mm -hmm. to have your currency, but you all are lo to looking at each other and saying, I'd rather have dollars or euros um, mm -hmm. or gold or whatever. So, you know, each country is like on a different ladder of this thing of exploitation of currency. Um, and at the top is the US, like the dollar has dominated in terms of just like health, uh, value, uh, purchasing power, all these things. And, but you know, that's, well, I mean, that there's geopolitical negative externalities there. Like, like in order for the dollar to be the dominant system, there's oh. a little bit of like dependency theory here. Like it, it, it almost requires weakness elsewhere, right? Like it, 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 what we do it to was a, it up. was a trade off the Go world ahead. the world's traded traded away a lot of their their physical freedoms in exchange for a little bit of you know dollar dollar well, stability for the dollar's taking on certain risks it's i know they, 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 there was a trade off there and it was not vote. necessarily a fair trade no people didn't get to vote like 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 one of the <laughs> reasons that 
I'm talking about negative externalities of the dollar is that like for this dollar system to move along, the U.S. government requires uh, this policy. Well, yeah. the dollar is no longer <laughs> backed by gold. Uh, so it's backed by something called the sort of the petrodollar agreement, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we use all of our guns and, and ships and violent threats to ensure course, that like these- To back up the value of the, the currency, to, to add some supposed stability yeah. to, to global supply chains. In inverted commas. Well, like we basically say- <laughs> To enforce it. <laughs> through the oil producing nations, it, yeah. you need to sell your oil in dollars. And if you sell in a different currency, we're going to come and destroy you or do a regime yeah, change. There's a threat. There's a threat <laughs> behind that. And it, it was used by force. <laughs> twice. I mean, Iraq and Libya were both cases where the local dictator was like, I want to sell in some other currency. And we were like, oh, really? Uh, okay. You know, no. That's not <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So basically like the, the dollar system has a lot of negative externalities that include the U.S. propping up all sorts of unsavory dictators, um, which then on their own promote terrorism and all sorts of things. Uh, it, it, it's not been as rosy as a picture as people would, you know, have, you know, lead you to believe. I mean, clearly like there's massive benefits that have accrued to the world over the last several decades in, in terms of big advances in certain areas, of course, but like that has not accrued equally. It's, it's, it's not accrued equally. No. So um, it's, it's not the same, accrued. the same thing. Domestically too. I mean, fiat currency is does require a credible threat of violent force at a certain level. I mean, once the sort of faith in any sort of currency system runs out, you kind of have to be able to back that up, either by sort of threatening people to send them to jail, they're not going to pay their taxes in your currency on a domestic level. Yeah. Or as you said, on an international level, you kind of need the credible threat if you're going to back this up. Sure. That's, and that's like, what gives it its underlying base value. The, Obviously the, you don't want to get to that, but no, no, the dollar the, system the like and the, the and the pound system and they, they all leverage it's called, you know, the cancel on effect. Like they all leverage mm -hmm. the people closer to the mint and benefit them more than the people further away. So even inside the US, yeah, mm -hmm. like people closer to Wall Street accrue more privileges and benefits than, you know, the blue collar workers and the Uber drivers. Or this is like quite, quite obvious. Um, but the point is that even those people, at least their the, the, the fiat currency that they earn, at least it doesn't depreciate as fast as like most people's, right? At least the dollar holds its purchasing power reasonably well over time. Um, now, uh, <laughs> not Today. the case in other countries, as you know, right? So why is Bitcoin being used? It's pretty simple. Like Bitcoin does not de decrease the purchasing power as quickly over time. In fact, it actually, you know, we talk about a store value or like something that preserves purchasing power. Bitcoin is not just a store value. It actually appreciates your purchasing power like over time. So it's a technology that, that, that gives you anyone something to acquire without needing to use ID or having a certain status or ethnicity or whatever, that you can get into this thing that's not going to be stolen from you or debased. And that, that's extremely powerful. So that's why you see people, whether they are entrepreneurs in Nigeria or, um, you know, traders in, in Argentina uh, or money exchangers in, in Zimbabwe or wherever, like people are realizing the value of this thing and, or human rights activists in Russia, like they're getting involved uh, because it's, it's like a really smart place to store value over time. It's the best technology for storing uh, for basically sending money across time that we have. Um, if you want to send a certain amount of money today to yourself in 10 years, the best way to do that is going to be through Bitcoin, not through fiat currency, because you know, it will depreciate, right? Certainly not through the RAND, right? Um, so people are like in the process now over the next 10 years, there's this great awakening to this reality. It's going to take a long time, but we're at the beginning of that like global awakening that this is the technology that you're going to want to use to send value not just across space, which it's very good at, Bitcoin in minutes can go anywhere in the world, but also across time. And, and it can go into the future and preserve its value or even increase its value dramatically. So we're in the middle of this great awakening and people in emerging markets per capita are realizing this a lot faster than in like more advanced economies where we have this dollar, we, I call it the dollar privilege, but it really means it's, it's more about like any reserve currency, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, Euro, yen, we have this privilege. Sovereignty. Yeah, we're like our financial system works fine. Like, why would I need Bitcoin? Right. So people are very dismissive about it, very arrogant about it. And they, they, they push it aside. But for folks in emerging markets, if they can't get their hands on dollars, I mean, Bitcoin is a huge game changer um, and not just for its store value properties. Like 21 million is what gives Bitcoin its value. Yes. Um, absolute digital scarcity. 
absolutely important. This is the difference maker. This is why it's different from all fiat and other cryptocurrencies, but it has other attributes too that are incredible. I mean, the fact that it's permissionless, you don't need ID to use it. The fact that it can teleport, unlike gold, uh, the fact that it's divisible to 100 million uh, rather than, you know, oh, I have a gold bar, I have to like melt it down or whatever. The fact that we can verify it at home easily. How are you going to verify a stick of gold? It's not so easy. You have to like go to an assayer or something. Um, and the fact- well, uh, practical. Our, <laughs> the fact that it's programmable, it's incredible. So people not only have this like base layer settlement system of Bitcoin, which, which will get more expensive over time to use, but they have scaling layers on top of it due to the fact that Bitcoin, you can essentially do like smart contracts and stuff on top of it to allow you to like um, do these like instant private cheap payments on something called the Lightning Network. So exchanges in emerging markets uh, are, are realizing this. So Paxful is like probably the most important emerging market exchange globally. There's a few others too, like Binance, P2P and Bit local Bitcoins. Um, and I think all three of those are active in South Africa, but- um, Yeah, they are very, they've got quite a big presence. Yeah. But it's once again, it's it's uh, currently in that mm -hmm. crypto space and in the Bitcoin space, Yeah. Uh, what we really see is, sorry, see the slides gone off. Yeah. No worries. What we, what we really see in the, in the crypto and Bitcoin space is that it's, it's still really trading amongst really your wealthier segments of the market. So it's not necessarily getting into perhaps the people who, who might need it most, which sure. is, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the, to comment on that, um, just to wrap the I mean, previous, it, it will change. It will change eventually. Maybe. It's I mean, but, but just to, just to wrap much. the previous thought. So these like, Emerging market platforms that are P2P, peer-to-peer, -peer, they function kind of like, uh, if you're listening and you, you don't know much about this, they're kind of like an eBay where like you post some Bitcoin and somebody bids on it and then you sell it in this like peer-to-peer mm. -peer arrangement that's done with an escrow. This is happening across the world and they are now adding this technology called Lightning, which allows you to do like instant, much more private, uh, very cheap withdrawals and deposits. So people are essentially starting to use their Paxful account, like their savings account, it's in Bitcoin. The government actually probably knows about it, so it's hard to evade taxes. But like, you can then withdraw like into something that's that that gives you some sort of forward privacy, like when you withdraw from your, uh, you know, what's the biggest bank in South Africa? Uh, the the FNB Standard Bank. Absa, okay, Standard Bank. You, take, you have your Standard Bank account. You've got a certain amount of rand in. The government knows. Okay, but then you withdraw it into, through an ATM, and then you get some privacy, right? Um, so same thing with this. There's like people have Paxful accounts it's fairly transparent. They have this much Bitcoin in it, but then you withdraw and lightning. It's kind of like forward privacy through an ATM. So a lot of exciting things there happening. Now, as far as like the whole inequality, is it helping rich people? Um, so that's Ooh. a very nuanced <laughs> conversation. Uh, yeah, obviously, I want to unpack that in a second. Yeah, well, it's kind of similar to like the, I, I would really encourage you to consider the comparison with the mobile phone. Um, yeah. At the beginning, mobile phones were obscenely large, expensive, very expensive, pricey, clunky. They didn't work very well. So only the richest people had them. Okay. But over time, as you've seen, they've changed the lives of billions of people. Uh, according to like latest data, by the end of next year, more than 70% of the world population will own a smartphone. Okay. So you're we have talking... more than one per person where we are. So I think yeah. we have something like Two, two per for every human being. Yeah, so you're watching like the technological adoption curve is such that you have early adopters who are obviously much more wealthy per capita than the average person in the world. But then there's this S curve of adoption and over time more and more people adopt and at the end it kind of like, you know, coasts closer to 100% as, as most of the world adopts it. This is the same for washing machines, televisions, uh, the car, the airplane, et cetera. And not, and not every technology reaches total global um, penetration. I mean, not everybody's been on an airplane, but like, but like the point is that like, clearly it helps like the average person to have air travel or cell phones or televisions or radio or credit cards or the internet or email, even if at the beginning of all those technologies, the, the immediate benefits were only possible for the wealthy. Okay. This is like, absolutely inarguable over time. This is how it's happened. So you're seeing something similar with Bitcoin with one major difference. In each case that I just laid out, there was some sort of pre-existing wealthy community that was able to tap in. Um, the early Bitcoiners and a lot of the people that I've met through Bitcoin, like were not part of the Davos elite. They were not the people who ran the world. So a lot of these people who've, who've been committed to coding Bitcoin, a lot of these people who got in very early 
Um, not all of them were the Winkleby twins. You know, not all of them had just won this massive billions yeah. of dollars settlement from the from Zuckerberg. Um, some of them were very middle class or lower middle class. Some of them we don't know who they are. S some of them were in emerging markets. Some of them didn't have access to tradi traditional banking services. So, like, yes, of course, some of them were like very wealthy already. Um, but it's 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 very disruptive. Like the people who will be the richest people in the world in 10 years, it'll look extremely different from today's richest people, okay, because of the Bitcoin phenomenon. And if you look at the richest people in the world um, in 2020, it's not that different from 2010, which wasn't that different from 2000. So like we were stuck in this kind of like relatively slow moving uh, oligarchy globally. And that's going to be disrupted massively. Like I went to Davos uh, as a, as a observer uh, a couple of years ago. And I could tell you, this was, I think in 2018, nobody like there owned Bitcoin. Like nobody understood Bitcoin. There was a bunch of like blockchain and cryptocurrency nonsense, but like very, very, very few people understood Bitcoin. So you have the the oligarchy cartel that runs the world, the Davos elite, which included a ton of like industrial miners and dictators and CEOs of tech companies. Like I was at a lunch with like numerous warlords and, um, you know, the CEO of IBM and uh, Tony Blair was there and, you know, all the, the rogues gallery of people who run the world, right? Um, all kinds of like minor, like gold mining, like tycoons and stuff. A uh, guy from one of the guys who runs the Iranian dictatorship. It's a bizarre group of people but it's all the people who run the world basically right so it's like that group and have done really since the, the second world yeah, war and xi jinping I mean, the was there so. uh year before i went like like it's all the people who run the world right um and uh for better or worse like tim cook was there but also like he's sitting next to mbs from saudi arabia so what i'm trying to say is like the davos elite that run the world they don't they did not get into Bitcoin early. Trust me, they, they had no clue what Bitcoin was, even as even even as a couple of years ago. And most of them still don't have any clue. We have no hard evidence that even any government is actually accumulating Bitcoin today with the intention to save for the future. And it's 2021 and the price is almost 60,000 US dollars. So governments have still been very slow. Citizens have been far faster. Uh, billionaires have been very slow. A couple of them have gotten in, like Elon Musk, obviously. But Warren Buffett's still calling it rat poison or whatever. And Bill Gates says it's going to end the world. And it's not so like clear. You know what I mean? It's very different from like the mobile phone where all billionaires obviously would have gotten it first. This is different. Uh, most billionaires still don't own any Bitcoin. Okay. So, and we're 12 years into it. So it's a very different S curve than the other technologies, which were like immediately made apparent and accessible for the rich right away. Um, because of the way Bitcoin works and how different it is, it is very disruptive and it's not going to just automatically help billionaires. Okay. And in fact, it has helped many, many people who I've met in my work who literally are refugees who've had to flee a country that because of violent threats or, or social collapse. And I've met people from Afghanistan, Syria, Venezuela, and I can name other countries, uh, Sudan, who, who were faced with whether it was revolution, currency collapse, uh, mass economic unrest, whatever, they like turned their assets into this electronic format, this digital format, and they took the private key to it and they got the hell out of there and they started a new life somewhere else. So that was like not possible before Bitcoin. Like you, you could not do that. Like when refugees fled the Holocaust, like they, they left with whatever was on their back. Like they, didn't, they, they couldn't like take all their stuff and like memorize it or put it onto a piece of paper and then carry their wealth with them. Um, now you can. So I would say it's like, it's a very nuanced topic. Like, does Bitcoin benefit the rich? Like, um, it, it does, but yes, <laughs> but like not, but not thing. in the same way that, well, but not all of the rich, not most unfairly. of them are very, most of them are still very arrogant. I mean, in fact, that if you did a top a poll, of probably the top hundred richest people in South Africa, I'd be very skeptical if any more than 10% of them owned Bitcoin at this point a lot of them probably still believe in this blockchain nonsense. And I can say that because I've been to several business conferences. I've spoken at several business conferences in Joburg over the last few years and even hosted a human rights event there myself a couple, in 2018. And I can tell you that like, this was just not on the radar of people when I would talk to them. They had no grasp of what was happening. There are, there are definitely different pockets. I think that we've actually got some of the highest Bitcoin adoption in terms of like per capita rates in South Africa. Um, due to the fact that we do have quite a volatile currency, I think it's... Yes. it's 
scary as an investment, even for people that don't necessarily have a lot to but, invest. But, I mean, but I guess what I mean is like the, the rich <laughs> influencers, there, there are the yeah. rich influencers in your country, the established are, are, wealthy are not the first ones in. No, it not was, only that, but they're much more, in. but they're much more easily suckered into like NFTs and ICOs and all that bullshit. Like they got totally swindled by a lot of that stuff. Um, and Bitcoin was like this yeah. thing on the side that they thought was like boring or whatever. So uh, it, it's very sneaky, but like the, the short answer is uh, it helps everybody regardless of, it doesn't know how much money you have. So that's kind of the, the short answer, which is very different from other technologies as they've been adopted through history. Yeah, it's creating a new a, a new elite class, but it's a, it's a very new batch of people kind that of, are being... But- yeah, on, on the wealth sphere. But um, I suppose but, that- but, we just, but, about- just, but, but just to like finish that thought, but not not really though, because e- no matter how much Bitcoin you own, you cannot change the rules for other people. Like the Davos yeah. crowd can literally get together and decide we're going to change this interest rate or we're going to take money away from this ethnic group or whatever. You can't do that yeah, with that, Bitcoin. That's- that is an interesting point because what, what Bitcoin does differently is it has made some people like ridiculously wealthy very, very quickly. Some of them have, have been lucky. Some of them have been Great, smart, good for them. But it doesn't has, take you know, my like, power away. There's no problem with that. I'm, I'm yeah. fine with that. But what it has done is it's separated wealth from power to a degree. Like, you know, at, with Davos said, wealth equals power. You know, like it's a, it's, it's very, it's much, much less, sep- more, less separated. Whereas what you're saying from what so you far. explained earlier in terms of the Bitcoin network itself, having mm-hmm. the most money on chain does not give you the right to change the rules. No. Whereas that is not what happens in the world the, of fiat, where those wealth people learned, can buy you that. the ability. Yeah, those people learned that the hard way. Roger Ver, yes. who, who owned at 1.300,000 Bitcoin, can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, I mean, don't try to do the math on that. He tried to use his wealth to yeah, change to the Bitcoin network. And he failed miserably. And now he has this project called Bitcoin Cash, which is like a disaster. So it's this new kind of network between humans where it does it literally doesn't care how much you own, which is very, very different from the existing system because the wealthier you are, whether it's in South Africa or the United States or Britain or Japan, you can get into those boardrooms. You can talk to central bankers and you can actually have an influence over your country's monetary policy. It does not happen with Bitcoin. I'm sorry. So it's like a very different phenomenon. Yeah, it has separated that that sort of the, the ability to buy power or to use your, your wealth to manipulate mm-hmm. the rules, rules somewhat. Um, I think that what I did want to speak to you about, because when you are talking about sort of Bitcoin in terms of human rights and in terms of social stability, you, we've kind of touched on two different cases. You've touched on the case of like your failed states or your failing states where people mm-hmm. use this to actually be able to protect their wealth and, and perhaps even to protect their person to take their their assets out of a failing country to protect their their assets from a failing currency itself and also as you mentioned in the in like your parts of the world like like america where you can use that of course to sort of as you say move your cash through time and look at it as a as quite an investment case mm-hmm. what i'm more interested in from my work because i do tend to work in the sort of economic slash futures space which is an interesting space to be in is the effect that these sorts of disruptive new systems have on intermediate states. And I think South Africa is an interesting case study there too, because we're not a failed state yet. We have problems. There's a lot of insecurity in our political system and in our economic system. But, you know, if we, if we get our ducks in a row, we could turn things around. However, the, the, the very existence of something like Bitcoin creates a different layer of capital outflows. I mean, it, it literally does. It allows people like myself who happen to be on the sort of have the, the luxury of have some cash that I can invest in assets like this to essentially mm-hmm. ring fence it and to take it out of the hands of perhaps questionable politicians and out of the reach of central bankers that might not have my interests at heart. So from a, from a purely selfish perspective, it makes fantastic sense for me to save as much of my personal assets and as much of my future value for my daughter in things like Bitcoin or to get it Mm -hmm. offshore into other investments. However, that also creates uh, vicious and virtuous circles because the more cash that is essentially exited from the world of Caesar or the realm of Caesar, the realm of the state, the realm of Mm -hmm. the the tax tax man and the the money, the money men in the the central banks, the less there is to solve the real social problems on the ground from a nation state perspective. So the more people like me act in my own interests and protect my own wealth for very sensible reasons, 
the more likelihood there is that the nation state itself does become insolvent going forward. And in a country like South Africa, we are the most unequal country in the world. I think it's a good case study to just sort of talk through a little bit. And there are more people than not that are literally dependent on the state for welfare payments. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that creates an interesting case where people acting in their, their self-interest, or not, not selfishly, but in sensible self-interest, create a condition where we can turn a state that could have been turned around into a failed state. So it creates vicious and virtuous circles, sort of self-fulfilling prophecies. So I do like to talk about how there's this kind of two things you can do. You can sort of invest in the future that you do want, or you can hedge against the future that you don't want. And hopefully most of us spread our chips on the board in both directions. But that's an interesting question as to how disruptive this is. And can we have if they eventually sort of sort of unravel this out to its sort of logical yeah. conclusion yeah. is is disruptive borderless private money like bitcoin is it compatible with a social welfare state going forward do you have any thoughts on that i have not fully reconciled this with myself but i have realized that there is a bit of a catch 22 for people that might have a social conscience that might have a bit of being a privileged position that might be questioning where they're placing their chips on the future board going forward. That's uh, a probably yeah. question to ask no, you. No, <laughs> it's a very important question that I've thought about a lot. I mean, look, it depends how smart your government is. Right now, any government can get a first mover advantage. So if the South African government decides today to start mining Bitcoin using solar, using its prodigious solar capacity, um, or if it decides to just start swapping some of its fiat current, some RAND, which is very cheap and they can literally create as much as they want. If they can start decide to buy Bitcoin, they can create a base from which to do a lot of social good in the future. It's like up to them. Prospect. You are correct in that. Like if, yeah, no, literally like the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, what mm, they did yeah, is like they, a wealth they mined to... oil into mm. a very comprehensive, wonderful social welfare state. They turned correct. liquid gold into a social welfare state. Every other country in the world now is not constrained by do I have gold, do I have liquid gold under my country or not? You can mine Bitcoin with anything, with nuclear and turn power, into a sovereign with geothermal trust. power, wind, solar, whatever your country has. Every country has some sort of energy source. You could mine it. So it's it's it is now too late to say that like governments didn't act. Uh, they they can act right now, and the next decade will define what kind of society they can provide this. for their citizens moving forward. And the smart ones will be able to have this like asset base, like a sovereign wealth fund that can bail out its country when there's bad, crazy things that happen. I'll give you a good example. Last year, we had the global pandemic halted, hugely deflationary, halted uh, all kinds of like uh, travel and production. Great. The Norwegian government was able to like tap its sovereign wealth fund and bail out the air, the airline and all this other stuff. And they, they've been cool. They've like, been a little rocky but like norway's fine right so now is the opportunity for any government over the next decade to build up such a similar sovereign wealth fund based on energy okay in a much more fair way than than just oil states um that can preserve its purchasing power way better than oil i mean the oil went negative last year briefly like so so and Bitcoin's what not happens going if negative. we move away from that yeah then like, no, the we whole will. fossil we, fuel uh, industry uh, then uh, then what they're going to do now they become uh, accustomed to it <laughs> no and we will and eventually oil yeah. will become like a lot less valuable than it is today and like that's inevitable um definitely the mm -hmm. point is that like any the next the 2020s is the decade for governments to figure out they can establish this like base through which to, to create social welfare state in the future or do whatever they want. Honestly, some governments are not interested in social welfare. They're interested in genociding the Muslims or whatever. So it, it, is, it is entirely up to them as to what they want to do. Um, but it gives like what's important about Bitcoin also is not just that like it gives governments like a new model through which to finance their expenditures, etc is that it, it gives individuals and us citizens a way to check their bloat and their inefficiency and their violence. Like if you're a government that's like a little more constrained in what you can do potentially in a Bitcoin world, it's a lot less likely you're going to invade your neighbor or blow somebody up halfway around the world. Um, you're going to have to necessarily be much more tightly uh, focused on the demands of your citizens uh, or else they're going to leave. So like other countries will set up more, friendly jurisdictions and citizens will just be able to go there. Like Portugal today, no taxes on Bitcoin. Guess what? They're going to get a lot of people who move to Portugal and you start incredible new ventures and et cetera, et cetera. And the benefits will accrue there. Um, other countries will copy this model, like whether it's Singapore, God knows what. 
New Zealand, Taiwan, Florida, California, who knows? We'll see. Everybody's going to be competing in this new world where it's like a lot easier for people to move around. Um, so the point is that like, this is the big decade for governments to figure out, you know, will they be a strong or weak government in the future? And it, it all depends sort of on Bitcoin, honestly, uh, which sounds crazy. But I'd agree. But in, no, in I would years, absolutely agree. <laughs> in 10 years, it'll sound less crazy. Um, but again, it also gives us citizens a way to get out if the going's rough. Like right now, today in Nigeria, the going's rough. You have 200 million people, you have 15 to 20 percent inflation per year. The government is not looking out for them. It is actually sending police squads to kill them and it is stealing all their money and is making life miserable and is essentially like milking this like terror, this terrorist group to like allow it to grow a more prodigious security force. And there's all kinds of terrible things happening there. So people are opting out. Okay. So does that mean that this horribly corrupt vampiric system is going to go bankrupt? Yes, it will. Um, but what will take its place? I don't know. Could it be worse? We'll see. Uh, but we'll like, see. <laughs> these are, these are inevitable, not, not like stoppable trends. Like, citizens that learn about this asset are going to opt into it. Like it's not, it's peaceful. It's a voluntary thing. You can't stop them. So, you know, we have to start game gaming out what that's going to look like. But if there are any institutions, communities, organizations, governments that you care about, it would be wise to convince them to mine or accumulate Bitcoin now rather than in 10 years, it'll give them a much, a much bigger advantage. So, and the point is that the world's, People who control the world, they don't understand this yet. So it's a huge opportunity to, to, to onboard um, people who are less fortunate in today's world. I mean, we have years still to front run everybody else. So, I mean, people doing people who are like lower middle class, middle class people doing trading on Paxful in these countries today, like they already have some Satoshis to their name already. I mean, there's just not that many Satoshis. They already they're already involved. They're already in the mix. So let's educate as many people as we can on this because they'll have a bigger advantage in the future. And right now we know for sure that like most dictators don't know about this or don't care. Um, and most of the Davos people are still clueless. So it's going to be like a big shift in the world uh, for sure. And one that um, will make it very different in terms of financing public expenditures. But in my opinion, it'll be different in a way that's much more tied to the public interest rather than fighting some trade war or blowing somebody up halfway around the world or invading some other country, like the amount of money that, that our government spend on like defense, uh, you know, as opposed to education or whatever, like that's because citizens have no power to stop them. Correct. So um, if, if we do have the power to stop them and, you know, more of their income has to be derived from taxation of, of Bitcoin in the future, then they're going to have to listen to us a lot more freaking carefully. Okay. So it's like, it's just more of a, it's a different mechanism that will emerge in, in the future. But like those listening today have great power to, 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 to help shape the world, like enormous power. Like we'll never see anything like this again, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I suppose just one more question in terms of, obviously, as you mentioned, like the, the Davos set isn't necessarily the, the, the earliest adopters in this. And it's actually directly against their personal interests because this does disrupt the current sort of structures of power and hierarchy, particularly in the sort of nation state and geopolitical sphere. So we have seen that governments that as they start to understand just how disruptive this really is, they are cracking down on it in various ways. And I know like China has tried, India is trying, various African governments have tried and failed to stop whatever this is from, from happening to them. Do you think that there are any governments that are strong enough to actually stop Bitcoin from disrupting them? like a nation state, like we can use China, no. for example, which is a no. very strong state. Are there any governments that are not, that are going to be able to avoid this, making this trade-off? Because the question is really, you've got a choice. Either you work with this or, and, and relinquish some power, or mm -hmm. you work against it and you lose. How long can a very strong state maintain the current balance of power. And China's throwing everything at this for in terms of banning it, in terms of mm. trying to buy it, in terms, of, in terms of setting up competing systems like your central bank digital currencies. How successful can a state be and for how long can they avoid this? Because it seems from what you're saying, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have to make that choice. Either. Yeah, it's, it's a prisoner's dilemma-ish thing. Prisoner's um, dilemma-ish, yeah. Yeah, I... Uh... It's unclear, That's but I, what I would say is that, like, uh, I wrote this piece for Quillette, if people want to, like, dive in on, on, like, you know, can governments stop Bitcoin? 
Um, yeah, link it. I have read that. So yeah. And but the point of the article was essentially that like pointing out like, why haven't they stopped it yet? There's like a bunch of different reasons. Some of them are political, some of them are technological, some of them are economic, some of them are social. Um, but there's a whole bunch of like disincentives against uh, stopping it that range from it's really hard to do to B, it doesn't make any sense to C, it's too expensive to D, it would constitute a massive set of human rights violations and would be very unpopular. So there's like a whole bunch of reasons why governments haven't stopped Bitcoin. They have certainly tried, as you mentioned. I mean, the Chinese government has, and the Indian government, the two largest governments in the world have tried to restrict their citizens from using it. It hasn't worked. Bitcoin adoption has just accelerated in those two countries. Um, I wouldn't say the Chinese government really grasps this yet. I, I, look, there's still a lot of mining that happens in China. There's massive usage on Huobi and, you know, like different exchanges. Um, and a lot of like people use it to, to do commerce abroad and get 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 outside of capital controls and save outside of the CCP structure. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I think the Chinese government right now is much more focused on Jack Ma and on the big megacorps and on taking power back from them, way more focused on that than on Bitcoin. And, and you know, look, the DCEP thing they're creating, their central bank digital currency, just like every New York government, my government, they're all going to experiment with these things in the next few years. They don't compete with Bitcoin. Central bank digital currencies do not compete with Bitcoin because they are fiat currencies and their purchasing power decreases over time. This is not competitive with Bitcoin, which increases the purchasing power over time. It's a very important distinction. Also, uh, CBDCs will be designed for state level surveillance and control. So maybe not yeah, like funny, that. Yeah. your neighbor may not know what's going on, like in today's financial world, for the most part, unless there's a hack. Uh, but the government will absolutely know what you're doing with it. So I don't think CBDCs compete with Bitcoin in that same way. Um, and I, I, governments, I mean, it is ticking. Every day that they don't attack Bitcoin means it gets stronger. Okay. And in America, at least, where most people would agree, like a lot of the Bitcoin developers are, and a lot of the Bitcoin itself is, and growing infrastructure, and you know, companies like Coinbase, et cetera, like we are entering a pretty balmy climate right now. Like we have a, Bit a hardcore Bitcoiner on the Senate banking committee. We have almost 10 congressmen and women who've posted the Bitcoin white paper on their personal websites. We've got Coinbase, which is about to IPO at uh, almost $100 billion. It's going to be very similar to the Google IPO of 2004. It's going to usher in this new industry. Uh, it's, it's ticker is going to be coin. Like it's, it's just going to change the landscape so much. That's happening in a few weeks. Um, every single person in America will be able to passively invest indirectly in Bitcoin if they want to. So it's like really going to change the game. So we're entering into like our incoming SEC chair taught a course at MIT on Bitcoin, wrote a book on Bitcoin, uh, CFTC and other institutions have people like Hester Pierce who are very pro Bitcoin. So in America, we're entering like a very balmy phase for regulation in Bitcoin. Um, when Nuchin and Trump left office, they tried to attack Bitcoin as one of the things they did on the way out. They failed. They couldn't do it, etc. cetera. Um, so if the Secretary of Treasury of the United States can't be successful, um, guess what? Like It's going to be hard for others, too. And you're seeing this struggle play out in Nigeria and India, as, we, as you and I speak this week. And it's a big debate. It's on the pages of every newspaper in India, and it's it's on yeah. the TV all the time. And And you have a camp that says we have to stop it, and you have a camp that we says we need to be open to it. And the camps to that say we need to be open to it are going to are going to benefit more in the future. This is very similar to like governments being like we have to be against the internet. Well, like that's not going to tur turn out so well for your country generally speaking in the future. I mean a lot of what are you going to do become North Korea? So um so you don't want to like wall yourself off from this. So, I mean, when will we see this decision point? I don't know. Uh, last week, we saw the Singaporean Sovereign Wealth Fund lead an $80 million investment into a Bitcoin company. Okay, so we know that the Singaporeans at a high level at the central bank, at the Sovereign Wealth Fund, at the executive committee that runs Singapore, we know that they know what Bitcoin is and that it's going to be valuable and they want a piece of it. Okay, that's what we know. Um, we know that other sovereign wealth funds are having this conversation. Um, we don't have any evidence yet, again, that any governments are like hodling or like accumulating. We know that rogue nations have used it to get dollars. Uh, like, so for example, like Venezuela and Iran, we know in North Korea have like stolen Bitcoin from cryptocurrency exchanges or mined it one or the other in order to get dollars. They've to sold the Bitcoin. The street, yeah not necessarily to launder, but just literally to like accumulate dollars. Like the, the North Koreans stole bit, stole Bitcoin and then they sold it into RMB and then they sold that for dollars. The Iranians are getting around sanctions by using their energy exports uh, or from their from from the sources inside their country, and they're turning it into uh, uh, dollars through Bitcoin. Like like people are trying to 
get to dollars using Bitcoin right now. But we have no evidence that the North Koreans or the Iranians or the Venezuelans are like intelligently stockpiling Bitcoin. This is not anything we have any evidence for. So we're not there yet. So some rogue nations are using kind of the like permissionless censorship resistant element of it. Um, and some sovereign wealth funds and governments are starting to realize they should invest in it. That's kind of where we are with governments right now. Um, and the most important government in the world for Bitcoin is, is going to be the US, obviously. And, and we're entering into a very balmy territory. So, I mean, look, I would say in the next 24 months is going to be absolutely pivotal for all of this and for and for governments to 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 pay if, if they want to get ahead in the 2030s. Um, they got to they got to get involved now. Like fighting it is, is a futile game. It's a very futile effort. So, um, you know, if the CCP and the Indian government and the U.S. government can't stop it, like what, how, how will the Estonians or the, you know, South Africans or the Ethiopians or the Argentines? This is not happening. Yeah, so it's a very interesting point. I mean, you have to you have to choose as a government. You want to give up some powers because that does require giving up some powers. It means that it makes the very existence of something of like Bitcoin means you don't have control of your monetary system anymore. You're not able to play games like MMT so nicely. You you really can't yeah, because you do but, require no, sovereignty within your country. But, you can't but, play those same but, games but, anymore. But if you're a government official, hear me out on this one. You have something called Gresham's Law, which is very powerful for you. As if, if you're a smart government official and you're watching this Bitcoin adoption cycle, we're at 1.7% of the world's population have used it. So we're at the beginning of the S curve. You know this over the next decade or two, uh, Gresham's Law will be in full effect. Most people will not want to spend their Bitcoin. Okay. They want to save it for the future. Some will be forced to, but most will not want to spend it. So they will need government money to do stuff with. It will still be very valuable. So like take advantage of that if you're a government official. Like you have to realize that like people aren't just going to go straight to like paying for coffee with Bitcoin or like paying their taxes in it. That could take many, many decades if it ever happens at all. In the meantime, fiat currencies will still be the, what everybody uses for like day-to-day -day stuff. And it's going to be, they're going to be very important. So you should use this to your advantage and know this, like that there will be Gresham's law, bad money drives out the good. And the bad money will still reign for all the stuff we do day to day for the most part. Um, so I think you, well, I just, it's just impractical or it's not feasible to think that people are going to want to spend their Bitcoin if they have other options that are No, worse. no, absolutely not. You'll try the, the sort of the savings part of your economy then shifts into things like Yeah, Bitcoin. the savings might, but oh, like, okay. look, MMT, I think MMT and Bitcoin are going to coexist really well together over the next yeah, they decade have or two. Marvelous perverse incentives. They, they do fuel each other. Well, meaning like, very nasty, I, I'm nasty now way. much more at ease with my government doing massive economic social engineering of course. because I have a plan B. Like I, I can, I can, I can like convert some of my time and energy with to Bitcoin massive collateral and, then, <laughs> and then be like, you guys can go crazy, go for it. Like yeah. I'm actually much more sympathetic to some of the larger MMT goals in terms of like getting around, not bailing out the banks, but rather bailing out people directly, having like some sort of UBI, like using the government fiat money to help the poor. Like I'm all for it. Like do it, do, invest in infrastructure. Don't fight wars abroad. Don't have a fiscal cliff, like just spend whatever you can. Like as long as citizens know they have like this sovereign savings account that they can rely on, if that doesn't work out, like we're, we're good. So like, I think these two things will, and they won't, the two sides won't really like each other, but like- They fuel each other. They directly they fuel each other. coexist over the next decade, yeah. But not in, not, in, not in nice ways for all the collateral damage across no, space. No, but like fact. it's inevitable. Like even, and, and look, even the, the most hardcore MMT promoters today will quietly purchase Bitcoin in the next five years. There's no question. Of course they will, because yeah. both those goals work together. You know, the more the more money printer goes brr, the more Bitcoin goes up. So they kind of, I mean, it's, well, as soon as you it, invest it, it on both sides, you're playing both sides of that field. Well, and anyone- <laughs> You, you know, work together I, from a purely cynical perspective. <laughs> well, and the ethical considerations are hilarious because people are like, well, yeah. let's put it this way. They're like, oh, if you're promoting Bitcoin, then, you know, you have conflict of interest, right? Well, it's like, what about people who are promoting the dollar system? I mean, are they, would it be fair to like limit their exposure to dollars if they were to be credible and they have to use RAND basically, or, or et cetera, or like you in South Africa, if you're going to be like a scholar of the RAND, it, it, would it be fair to ask you to not use the RAND and not, please use this Zimbabwean currency in, instead? Th this stuff is absurd. Like, like it, it, this is a technological transformation for humanity. And like, if once you learn about it, there's no going back. Like Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy made a really good point. Um, if you're an Argentine company and you're making, you're doing business in dollars, are you gonna ever like take profits in dollars back into pesos? 
no, never. You would never do that. So the idea that like, like people are going to like make all this Bitcoin and then like take profits back into dollars makes no freaking sense at all. Like once you actually played out all the game theory, like this is going to happen. Yeah. The goal should be to like, for these corporations should be for their shareholders should be to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible in the next decade. Um, but it also it also does from a global sort of human rights perspective. It means that the more money your government prints, the wealthier you get if you are able to cash in on that as as your country as a as a collective or as an individual. Well, but at this, at, it comes at an expense to everyone else whose government isn't able to print quite as much money. So I do I do feel we need to kind of make that point. So this is yeah. it's. This is still finance. This is still a zero sum game. So if the dollar goes crazy and prints as much money as it can, the rest of uh-huh. us kind of have to accept it due to the sort of petro dollar thing. If they do, as you say, and set up a sovereign wealth fund, that, 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 that means America wins hugely, wins bigly, whatever you want to call it, in comparison to governments that either can't or won't participate in that. So this is a huge game to be playing here. It's a, and it's a global game. It's not what one nation state does has a direct impact on what the next one does. As you yeah. said, it's a limit. It's a finite number of. Yeah, but the, right. So the, the, out there. the, first the one decisions is, that governments are going to make win. about their fiat currency don't really matter that much. Like no, it really is all about Bitcoin. Like we're too early for that to sound not crazy, but it's true. Um, in five years, it'll sound less crazy. Uh, and political science departments around the world will be focusing on the geopolitics of Bitcoin. And none of them are right now, which is kind of nuts. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can pursue different right. policies <laughs> in the EU and the United States, um, and that'll have different effects in different countries. Like uh, if we print a lot of dollars, uh, that may make things easier to do, you know, for other countries to acquire dollars. Um, but it has other, you know, if it goes the other direction and we raise interest rates and lock up the economy and dollar becomes stronger, like, okay, well then like, then it's harder for your countries like you to pay off your dollar debt. And it, it, th- there's no like magic solution here. It's not, it's not like, it's not ever going to be perfect. Um, mm. But, but that, that social engineering will continue to, to proceed a pace uh, according to these new norms, which basically say that government shouldn't worry about um, a debt, uh, like their debt, essentially their sovereign debt. They shouldn't worry about that. Shouldn't worry about a fiscal cliff. Instead, they should just, you know, keep spending until there's some sort of inflation and then they can like stop spending. And that appears to be the new mantra. We'll see um, how that works out. Bitcoin but in the meantime, a few spanners and that works too. Doesn't which is hilarious because like <laughs> people in America and Canada are like thinking like this is like some new thing. No, this is like literally what governments have done around the world. They've literally spent until they felt some inflation and then they kept spending and then it became more inflation, more inflation, more inflation. This is some like of them fail. very common. <laughs> No, they all fail. Pull they all back fail from eventually. the cliff a little bit. <laughs> no, it's like historically what has happened. There's a great, there's a new piece on the history of Chinese monetary policy that came out, a new book, and it was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago, Empire of Silver. And it, it's like hilarious because like, or, or sad, I guess, that like, this is so predictable. Like th- there was, there once was, um, you know, like a silver based economy in China and then people shifted to paper money and then eventually the paper money got hyperinflated and they went back to silver. It's just this like cycle that kept going on and on and on. And eventually in the 1930s, FDR passed an act where like the US government basically like was willing to buy all the silver in the world for more than market price uh, to help out like domestic silver people yeah. essentially. But what it ended up doing is it it, all, it, it <laughs> siphoned all the silver out of China and it crushed their currency. And then they ended up having to create a different one that had another hyperinflation. So it's like, it, it, all these things are in cycles, but like the, the new cycle that we're about to go into is relates directly to the Bitcoin, to Bitcoin. And, and like, what is your government's policy on Bitcoin? And the policies that are smarter about incentivizing Bitcoin entrepreneurs and Bitcoin business oh, and, and Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin holdings and treasury and collecting taxes in Bitcoin is like, like if you provide incentives for your citizens to pay your pay their taxes in Bitcoin, like that's a huge Bitcoin revenue flow. And like, what, what, what government's going to do that first? It's like super interesting. The mayor of Miami already wants to do it. So it's like, we'll see. I mean, no, trust me, no Bitcoiner is going to want to pay their taxes in Bitcoin. This is the whole Gresham's law thing. They're going to want to, they would choose to pay even at a massive premium. They'd rather pay more to pay in fiat than, than to give away their precious Bitcoin, right? So we'll just have to see how this all plays out. But it's something that every government decision makers should be thinking about right now. And I'm telling you they're not. So it's time for you to front run them essentially and to share this knowledge with all the communities you care about. Correct. Because this is like the big moment in time when you can have an outsized impact, uh, historically speaking. And it, it, it will be a fleeting moment. I mean, it'll be a decade or so 
um, before the world changes completely. So now is the time. And then the world order emerges. And, that, and that's totally. the thing. This is, this is offering an opportunity for social mobility on an individual basis to get a new cohort of the new, as you said, the new sort of wealthy people are going to come from different places. It's a, it's a rare opportunity in history to upend that pyramid a little bit. It's an opportunity for social mobility on an individual level, but also from a sort of a, a reshuffling of the, the global order in terms of which nation states are going to emerge more powerful at the end of this. I mean, we are already at quite an interesting point in time, geopolitically speaking, even without mm -hmm. Bitcoin, but this does offer an opportunity for new, for smaller states, for people that haven't had much power on the global stage to make some interesting plays. But it is a case of, you know, the first ones then win here. It's not necessarily the, the biggest that win this time. It's more like the fastest. And I want to comment on that, uh, perhaps. But um, <laughs> people are like, oh, it's an early bird gets the worm game. <laughs> not necessarily. Like, if you actually look at the history of Bitcoin, um, a lot of the early Bitcoiners, um, just think about the, the way the market psychology has worked. Like, if you got some, like, free Bitcoin from somebody when it was worth a dollar, you probably sold at $10 or you sold at $100. You certainly didn't hold till $60,000, okay? So That's it is very, point. very, very <laughs> rare for people who bought between 2010 mm. and 2000, let's say um, 14, the early years in Bitcoin when you could get it below $200 a coin uh, US, um, it is very, very rare that those people did not sell at 500, at 1,000, at 10,000, at 25,000, at 40,000. Even though it was the wrong it, thing right? to do, it was <laughs> rare for them to not take profits back into dollars because the system was different. The other thing about Bitcoin that, that is important. So, so number one, not all early, Bit most early Bitcoiners did not like benefit in the way you think they did. They probably all sold. It was incredibly arduous and torturous to hold that whole time. And, and it was depressing. I mean, for years, it, it went up to $1,300 and it crashed to 200 and stayed there for years. So you really had to earn this. It was not easy. You were not lucky if you got in early. You, you're very impressive if you held throughout all that. The second thing, though, is actually very an important point is that now Bitcoin is a much better investment than it was when it was $10. OK, when Bitcoin was $10, it was absurdly risky. I it mean, was a gamble it, at that it could, stage. Totally. It could have gone to zero <laughs> for sure. All this stuff. Yeah. It was like all involved in the Silk Road. So for those first four, five, six years of Bitcoin, it was an insanely risky investment. People looked at you like you were crazy. Okay. So the amount of money and time you invested in it was a huge gamble. Today, when Tesla and Square and sovereign wealth funds are getting involved, it is no longer that risky. Um, yes, it still has a risk profile like any other asset. But it's a much more healthy investment than it was before, which is something else people don't understand. Like the more Bitcoin, the longer Bitcoin exists, the less risky it will be and the more obvious its benefits will be for people. So it's not so straightforward to say, oh, it benefited all the early people. No, because most of them didn't hold the whole time. Uh, there's, a fam there's a guy who, who posted a video of him narrating the crash of Bitcoin when it crashed from a dollar to a cent. It's incredible. It's like a live reading. And he's like, oh my God, it's going 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents. It's like back in 2011. And um, that guy re recently reappeared. We found him on the internet. And he, he, he's still got the same shitty apartment that he was in then. So it's not like this guy's like our future overlord. He probably sold all his Bitcoin. So it's like, it is not the case that like the early bird got the worm necessarily. You really have to understand that. It was like incredibly hard to hold your Bitcoin through that time period. Um, and it was a ridiculously risky investment. Today, now there's a corporate and governmental and citizen narrative emerging where this is the thing you want to put your money into long term. There's a lot of literature that explains this. There's a lot of thinking, a lot of debate. There's it's in all the newspapers. Like it is easier to learn about Bitcoin today than it was 10 years ago when it was like this crazy thing on the internet. It's so, easier to get it. I mean, quite frankly, it's oh like, my God, know, way easier. But it's it, also it was just quite like, hard back in 2020. It's a smarter investment today. It's much more safe for people yeah. to invest in, is all I want to say. So I just wanted to diffuse that myth that like, oh, it's always the earlier, the earlier you get in, the better. Um, that's not the practical, uh, However, that is not practical, like lesson. That's not, that did not talking happen. Talking about the, the nation states right now, it, it absolutely is. The, the, the for the nation states, it is. Yes, there's quickly. no question. Whichever <laughs> because, nation state realizes this first. No, 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 but, but, but actually, no, 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 we're still in the same cycle though. Actually, let's actually unpack that. The first nation states that started messing around with Bitcoin were the rogue states. They weren't holding. They're not saving they in Bitcoin. Holding, They're right. spending it to get dollars. So we're still in the same cycle of the earliest users don't understand what it is. They don't realize it's a store of value. They're using it as 
uh, essentially the, the, the Silk Road really is a great example of like what the North Koreas of today are using it as. They're using it as a Silk Road to like do whatever bad shit they want to do. OK, but over time, it's going to mature much like it has for citizens into a wise asset for the long term. The, the only people it will really benefit will be the governments that realize that it's a store of value first and not just a way to get around sanctions or laws or whatever. So we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so we're, the jury's still out on when that's going to happen, right? Probably so we'll sooner rather than later. Probably some of the smaller, yeah. smarter states. But um, I, I suppose from my perspective, it's still most interesting what China's going to do with this, if they're willing to do the, the power compromise, given their plans, and what America's going to do. I think that mm-hmm. somewhere in between the rest of the world is going to take their cues from either of those two positions. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to close off with before I let you go, because I think I've already taken up more than an hour of your no, time. No, it's... Uh... I think that you're right. The China, China, what what China and what America does will be, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in this uh, little like, not really. A, it's more of a very very cold war. Um, it's it's, it's uh, much less of a cold war than the previous one. Um, but yeah, we're like starting to see like the world kind of reemerge into this bipolar um, structure based on countries that owe China debt. Uh, you know, that were, you know, or, or ones yeah. that are in these strategic alliances with America. And the debt we'll have to see, question, which is interesting. Very and, you know, look, <laughs> right now, it seems like Americans are going to benefit a lot because the government is being less restrictive. Um, but even in China, look, Bitcoin is digitally protected. It's, pro- it's property. It's not illegal to have. Um, it's not illegal to own. Um, so even China has been pretty open minded about it. And look, they're they're at you know, a brutal genocidal dictatorship, but they're not like stupid. They're not like in as much as they're not, they, 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 they know how to play the game of geopolitics. Right. So I, I wouldn't rule out that they start to figure out that Bitcoin matters for them. I mean, it would not be shocking. Um, the cool part is it doesn't matter what they do because whatever they do in the end will help Bitcoin. Like if they decide to be restrictive in China, and force out all the mining and, and force people to go elsewhere. Perfect. That decentralizes it's Bitcoin mining. Money. And we no longer have Bitcoin mining in Xinjiang or in coal heavy inner Mongolia, which just banned Bitcoin mining the other day. That's fantastic for Bitcoin. If they decide to stockpile it and drive the price up, great. That's also great for Bitcoin. Drives up the network security, adoption, user base, etc. So there's not really like whatever they do, it's kind of like they're screwed. Like, like they, they can really only help Bitcoin, which is, which is kind of crazy. So um, we'll, we'll be watching what happens there for sure. Absolutely. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, one more question. What about, can you, can, will governments be able to actually tax Bitcoin itself? So you mentioned taxing in paying your taxes in Bitcoin, but if someone is earning and earning income in Bitcoin yeah. and they have their supply yeah, chain in Bitcoin, how can how can governments actually tax well, that from two ways? I mean, you sort can, of social justice question. Well, yeah, of course. So Bitcoin mining will be heavily taxed. Uh, so if you run That's a thing. Uh, Bitcoin mining operation inside of Texas, I'm sure the Texas government will figure out. I mean, at first they're going to want to incentivize it to attract you, but eventually there's going to be taxes you pay as a mining company, and those are going to differ around the world. But there will be a lot of taxes on Bitcoin mining. It'll be, it's not as much money as people think. Like today, it's around fifty million dollars a day globally, and if you actually split that up between all the different countries. It's not like that much revenue. Um, it will probably grow though in the future, uh, but but less so than people think. Like mining won't really be the way to get taxes. Uh, the, the way to get taxes is going to be on taxing when people convert their Bitcoin, you know, into on something else. Front. Well, when you sell Bitcoin and you accrue the capital, all the gains you've accrued, there'll be a capital gains tax. That's how governments will, I think, um, benefit tremendously is by having good tax policies in place that that encourage people to do their taxes and 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 or and to, to spend it in any way, even into yeah, or to spend. Like property. You and, have to get you know, out the system to tax it then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's pretty tough to like. You can't just six one zero two Bitcoin. Six one zero two is something that happened in the United States in the '30s when the government basically seized all the gold because of yeah. Bitcoin's digital self custodied nature. It's basically built to resist the six one zero two attack. So it's not like governments can just like seize all the Bitcoin. So, but they can encourage you to spend it. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of creative ways that governments are going to figure out how to harness uh, Bitcoin in order to you know fund themselves and pay for the stuff they want to do, and that's going to come through a di- rather than force from violence. That's going to come from a dialogue and a conversation with their citizens. An incentive, which are, which I'm some carrots, very excited about. Hell yeah, yeah. So that's but also, exciting. It also to think allows about. us. 
to change our entire in tax systems, because our tax systems essentially at the moment sort of punish productivity and people. So you sort of, most of our tax is, is from income and yeah. from profits. Whereas if we are, you won't be able to do that so easily if companies are paying salaries and earning incomes in things like Bitcoin, that it becomes easier yeah, to actually start I, taxing I, things. So it allows like, us to re have that conversation, to open it up, to see how yeah, we can I, design this whole thing. Long term, I think we the, the, the transition period we're embarking in right now for the next few decades is going to be really weird. Um, but long term, I mean, if hyper Bitcoinization does end up happening, like it's it's. I mean, all the functions of today's world will be just replicated and restructured. I mean, like there will still be all kinds of credit. There will still be all kinds of loans. There will still be entrepreneurs who start companies and need to borrow. I mean, it, 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 I don't think it really changes a lot of the superstructures that we've created so far, um, ultimately. But, but like it's going to be very disruptive in the next few decades for sure. But like all general aspects of finance will just be sort of like, you know, in my opinion, like reformulated. I mean, even banking, like... Like, you already started. <laughs> like, yeah, like, look, it already, look, there's a company called BlockFi. I'll give you an example. Like, you can, I'm, uh, you could custody, custody your own Bitcoin. It's quite easy, right? Anyone can do that, figure it out, spend a few hours watching some videos. They can take control. There are now companies, though, that are willing to pay you six, 7% interest to, to, for you to give them your Bitcoin. Okay, there's a big risk, but hey, you get the yield, right? On top of the existing yield, right? So let's say in the future, Bitcoin doesn't have this absurd 200% annual yield. And let's say it's like evened out. It's like gone up the adoption curve. It's, 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 it's a rate of increasing your purchasing power is lower than it is now. Okay. So now you're going to want to like loan it out to someone and get more yield for it. So like, and then those loans will be loaned out again to somebody else. And there'll be like all these money markets that pop up and this is already happening. It's already happening. So like even today in 2021, you're starting to see this little thing happening where like institutions and individuals are loaning out their Bitcoin. And then that, that company in the middleman, the broker is then loaning out that Bitcoin to hedge funds to do trades. So you're, you're already seeing this start to emerge. We don't have to wait till 2050 to see this. It's already starting to happen. So I, I believe that like a lot of the functionality of today's financial system for better or worse, will, will nearly just sort of be like rebuilt in Bitcoin. That's a great point to end it there. Do you have any closing comments on where can people find you? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, you can find me at uh, on uh, on Twitter at Gladstein. You can check out the work of the Human Rights Foundation at hrf.org. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, you can start uh, with the Little Bitcoin Book at thelittlebitcoinbook.com. Fantastic! Thank you so much.